Amen. Well, thank you, Emily. And uh, let's pray, and then we'll have a look. Lord, thank you that you pour out your spirit upon us. Thank you that you're di not distant, you're not indifferent, you're not absent, but you're present with us by your spirit. And we pray that we'd receive more of your spirit this evening. And we pray that by your spirit, you would help us to understand your word and understand your work in the church. Amen. Well, over the last few weeks, we've been following a series looking at the birth of the Christian community. And uh, the series has been called Church on Fire. And then last week, Nemi spoke, and the title of her sermon was Man on Fire, which was fantastic. So this week, my theme is taken from an Alicia Keys song, which some of you might be able to guess what it is. This girl is on fire. Thank you very much. Now, I'd like, uh, if we can bring a picture up, I want to show you a woman on fire. This is my mum. That's me, the taller of the two lads. This is 1973. And that's my little brother who's a vicar down under. And you can see, I only realized when I saw this photograph this week visiting my dear old mum, where I got my aesthetic from. <laughs> there it is. It's all to do, no doubt, with attachment or something deep and psychological. Anyway, you can take that down. My mother was a real leader. Uh, she had administrative and organizational and visionary and pastoral gifts. She, when I was growing up, she was a county councillor and was encouraged to become an MP, but decided uh, against that. But she was a chairman of numerous boards for schools and social services, and she helped lead the Plymouth City emergency response in case of a nuclear strike in the 70s, yes. She was elected town mayor twice. She was friends with MPs. She dined with our wonderful former queen and our current king. And she was a very gifted businesswoman. Uh, she worked for national supermarket chain. She was very senior in that. She was the head of all contracts for non-consumables, everything that uh, was in every supermarket in Britain um, for this particular national chain of supermarkets. She oversaw the contracts, and she was just a very impressive woman. She, as well as wearing a very cool waistcoat, <laughs> she wore furs and drove fast cars, and she had real style. And that's how I remember my mum. And she's still like it. I visited her this week. She's in her 80s. Remarkable. Yet on a Sunday, everything changed. And we'd go off to church as a family, and suddenly it seemed as if my mother shrank. She would put on a very plain suit. She would always wear a hat. And she would regress to being some little mouse all mild, passive, and silent, and meek, and unrecognizable to me as my mother. Who is this? What has happened? Superwoman in reverse, it seemed, on a Sunday. And I wondered as a young man growing up what this was all about. And what I concluded was that church made my mother shrink. Church made my mother shrink. When my dad was a pastor of a conservative Baptist church, mum organized their centenary event. And she brought all that creative and uh, visionary and administrative abilities that she had to planning a mission. 
She planned a visitation of every house in the town. She put together the teams and the pairs. She booked tents. She uh, organized different speakers. She even had, and we're going back now, tried, she tried to get Cliff Richard to do a special <laughs> evening. And um, it was going to be amazing. I remember as a young man, she was showing me all the details of this plan. And then it came to nothing. And uh, the elders and the deacons and the church members voted against the mission. Instead, they built a car park and had a flower show. And I remember thinking then, something's really wrong about church. My father actually resigned shortly thereafter. The problem was there was no room for a woman with leadership and vision and mission and passion and unction in that particular church at that particular time. Very different in the New Testament church. Very different in the Church of Acts, the apostolic church, the church on fire. I want to make a couple of points. And the first is this, that there's room in the upper room for women and men. In Acts 1 verse 14, it talks about being together with the women. After Jesus ascended, the disciples returned to Jerusalem. They returned to this rented upper room that they'd been using for a month. And there they waited. And they readied themselves. They prepared themselves for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, wait until you are clothed with power from on high. He says, you'll receive power when the Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost ends of the earth. But you've got to wait until you're empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so they spend these 10 days after the ascension, before the descent of the Spirit at Pentecost, praying. And they're there in the upper room. But something has changed in the makeup of those who are present. Luke says they returned and with one accord they devoted themselves to prayer. And verse 14, he then has this little phrase, it's so easy to miss. It's so easy to miss it out. But there it is, together with the women. It's generally accepted that at the Last Supper in the upper room, there were Jesus and the 12 apostles. But now that inner ring has extended. And long before the church goes from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost ends of the earth, the circle expands to include, to incorporate the women. It names the Blessed Virgin Mary, Jesus' mother, the other women are not named, but interestingly, elsewhere in Luke's gospel, Luke is at pains to mention the women who are key to the ministry of Jesus. Luke 8, he talks about Mary Magdalene, Salome, Susanna, Joanna. It's possible that all of them were there along with Mary and Martha of Bethany and the wives of the apostles. And Luke is often at pains to show the balance and the pairing of men together with women. We read in the birth narratives where he talks about Zechariah and Elizabeth witnessing the birth of Jesus, Mary and Joseph, Simeon and Anna. And then as we go through Acts six times, Luke repeats this phrase, both men and women. The mark of the church, the apostolic church, the church on fire, is not just man on fire, but it's together with the women. This girl is on fire. And the church should recognize it. Luke's making it clear that women are at the table. 
They're not just waiting on the table. And there's been a cultural and a spiritual paradigm shift that occurs at this time. In the Jewish temple, men and women were separated by a physical wall. Still today, if you go to uh, the temple wall in Jerusalem, you'll see that the women and the men are separated by this screen. I've been a number of times. In many synagogues today, men and women are separated by a screen, a mahiza. The Orthodox Jewish Mission Society, Chabad, in an article states that separation of the sexes is necessary because women and men are very different beings. But Jesus here changes everything without changing the ontological distinction between male and female. In terms of ministry, they receive the same anointing. The very first image of post-resurrection church in the upper room, praying and awaiting the outpouring of the Spirit is that the men are there together with the women. Together with the women the women. And who are these women? They're the same women who were welcome to sit at the feet of Jesus, the rabbi, and soak in his teaching, something unheard of in first century Jewish culture. It's the same women who ministered to his practical needs out of their finances, the same women who stayed till the last at the cross. It's the same women who were there when Jesus was laid in the tomb. It's the same women who were the first at the tomb on Easter day. It's the same women who were the first to meet the resurrected Lord. The same women who were the first to testify to the resurrection. These are the women in the upper room. They're in prayer, and these are the women who are there on the day of Pentecost, receiving the same baptism of the Holy Spirit. Luke, in verse 15 of chapter 1, mentions there are about 120 of them. And he's not just throwing out a number, he's making a very important statement. You see, 120 was the number of priests that served in Solomon's temple. 120 was the number of male priests who were set apart and anointed to minister for God. Luke knows what he's doing. He's not just saying, oh, coincidence. Here are 120 men and women who are filled with the Spirit. And here the new temple of God is formed as the Spirit comes and births the church. The women are there at the birth of the church. The women are there filled with the Spirit. Secondly, what God has joined, let no church and no male leadership put asunder. Together with the women. This is not sat easily with some men. At a conference in 2019, a very famous conservative preacher was asked what two words he would say to a well-known woman Bible teacher. And he replied, go home. I once heard in this church a famous conservative preacher that we'd invited responding to one of my students who asked a question saying, you don't believe women should be in leadership. Should women go to the mission field? And he said, let them go to the mission field. Let them lead someone to Christ. But when that person points out to them from the Bible, I do not permit a woman to teach, she can pack her bags and go home. And I publicly had to disassociate our church from that statement. A woman's place is in the home and the man's. And a woman's place is in the church with the men. A woman's place is there at the heart of the fire of Pentecost. But sadly, old hegemonies and misogynies creep back in. They crept back in in the post-apostolic era. By the patristic era in the fourth century, three centuries after this, men and women were sat separately in the church. 
already the divide had begun. Chrysostom wanted a literal physical wall to be down the center of church so men were not distracted by women when they're praying because they're more important in their prayers. And St. Augustine said, the masses flocked to the churches and their chaste acts of worship where a seemly separation of the sexes is observed. Very early on, men and women that God had brought together by the power of the Spirit were pushed apart. When I was a boy growing up, I attended my grandparents' exclusive Brethren Hall in Bristol every summer. We'd spend summer with them. And the men sat separately from the women. In fact, the men had a completely separate service. And I don't know what the women were doing because I wasn't there. I was with the men, even though I was a boy. And the men did their service. One would get up and prophesy. One would give a talk. One would... I remember going home and saying to my grandma, what was that man doing standing up speaking? And she says, silly old goat. He says the same thing every week. <laughs> um, but they would only come together at the end for a cup of tea. They did church different. Something was really wrong. And in my experience, an imbalance between the sexes in church and an inequality between the sexes in church got flipped when you went home. And then you knew exactly who was in charge because something had gone wrong. And it sowed a strange spirit. Paul, uh, Luke says, the apostles together with the women and Mary and Jesus' brothers. It's interesting that Catholic tradi has traditionally, when reading this passage, emphasized not the apostles and not the women, but Mary. And has even gone so far as to say it's Mary's intercession in a special way, along with the Father and the Son that sends the Spirit. And then the hot prots, they've ignored Mary, unfortunately, and they've emphasized the fact that the women were the apostles' wives, saying that it was good for the wives to also be strengthened. I think they're missing the point. This is the upper room. This is the war room. And it's not about Mary's intercession, and it's not about the wives of the apostles having a blessing. It's about men together with the women seeking God and then in 10 days after that prayer meeting began, God came and anointed them both for battle. And then thirdly, the upper room is the boiler room that drives the church. And in that upper room we need men together with the women. In Acts 2, when the Spirit comes, it doesn't simply come on the men. It comes on all 120 of those who were there, men and women. The tongues of fire divided and separated and came on them all. The fire is a symbol of the presence of God upon them, among them. And that fire that came on them sets their tongues on fire. Not just the men's tongues. The women didn't stay silent at Pentecost, feeling the spirit, whilst the men declared the wonders and mysteries of God. And then Peter proves and approves by quoting Joel, the promise of God, hundreds of years earlier, that saw this day and said, God's promise, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, not male flesh. Your sons and daughters, servants and maidservants, male and fe female, shall prophesy. Shall prophesy. And the church is built on the apostles and the prophets. You see, this is the spirit level, male and female. The spirit leveler, male and female. Now, some of you will be sat there saying, yeah, but what about those other two texts, the one in 1 Corinthians chapter 
14, the one in 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Timothy 2, and certainly, and I'm very happy to spend time working through those passages with you if you'd like and parsing them. But I think those two pragmatic context specific texts do not undermine what we see God do, actually do at Pentecost. The work of God that sends the spirit upon the women who prophesy. And then what we actually see in apostolic practice. Luke's not hiding the men, the women from the men. He's not, he's, not, he's not excluding them. He could have written them out of the story, but instead he emphasizes the writing of them into the story because they're key to it. And Paul, in practice, honored women in leadership. That's why he sends Phoebe, a deacon, a leader in the church, with his letter to the church in Rome. And in those days, the carrier of the letter wasn't just a post person. They would actually bring the letter, read the letter, preach the letter, explain the letter further. That was their role. The first preacher and teacher of the letter to Romans was a woman. And who do, who's in charge in that church? Paul honors Junia. Who is Junia? We don't know, but she's one of the leaders of the church and she's a notable apostle. And then he honors Priscilla. The church is run in her house. Was she just making tea while the men were about their business? Not a bit of it. She's in charge of the church. Was the first pope a woman? I've got in trouble for saying that before, but I am inclined to think there's something in it. <laughs> you see, women were last at the cross and first at the tomb and there in the upper room and there at Pentecost. And whenever the Spirit is poured out through history, Women are anointed and appointed and released to minister in power. You know, in the 20th century, women have outnumbered men on the mission field by two to one. Extending the kingdom of heaven, presenting Jesus and discipling the church and bringing God's goodness. The founder of China Inland Mission, Hudson Taylor, who employed uh, amazing women evangelists, said this, at Pentecost, God did not arrange a special women's meeting. Consider John Wesley, who was filled with the spirit and whilst being a minister here in Oxford, a chaplain at Lincoln, he licensed women to preach in his churches and women led small groups that fueled the massive church growth and the revival that happened in the mid 18th century. He was the first to ordain the women. Well, the first was God at Pentecost. What about William Booth, the founder of Salvation Army? He said, my best men are women. My best men are women. And the great growth of the Salvation Army was dependent upon the 50% of officers who were women. What about C.T. Studd, one of the greatest evangelical missionaries to the heart of Africa, uh, and he went to China. Um, he said that his two most effective missions and mission um, bases were manned by women. I love the kind of semantic irony there. They're manned by women. And he boasted that a cannibal who had reputedly eaten a hundred people was converted by a woman. I mean, these missionary biographies. What about the Welsh revival? There's a study that has shown that it was largely women who caught the fire and spread the fire. What about the Chinese house church? In the 1980s, many of the male leaders were in jail. The church was 85% female in its leadership the fastest grown church in the world. You see, the Lord anoints women. And when the church recognizes this and releases this, amazing things can happen. I knew as a boy something was not right in church by the way my mum was treated, by the way my nan was sat to one side and then made the tea. And I think the church needs to repent 
of all the wrong that it's done. Men within the church need to repent of keeping the gifting and the anointing to themselves and not recognizing and releasing it in the women that God has put his hand on. There's an amazing verse in Psalm 68, verse 11. It says this, the Lord gave the word and the great army of women proclaim it. The Lord gave the word and the great army of women proclaim it. Some translations take out the word women and just say a great army, but it's a feminine collective noun. It's a female congregation who preach it. So I just want to encourage you this evening. If you're a man, I want to encourage you to understand that God puts the women alongside the men together with them and anoints them just the same with the same spirit. And if you're a woman and the church has somehow put you down or push you to one side or you felt diminished that, that God has spoken yes over your life and put his spirit on you the way he's put it on the bloke beside you. And he's got a plan and a purpose and a gift and a ministry for you. The church in our nation's in real trouble. The rise of the world, the flesh, the devil. At times it seems it's gonna snuff out the light in the church. And one of the things we need to do at this time is to be a people of an upper prayer, upper room prayer meeting. We need to find our knees and our tears and our voice and our prayers. The other thing we need is to be a church on fire and seeking God for a fresh outpouring of the Spirit. And the third thing we need to do is to recognize and release the gifts that God has shed abroad in his church, both on men and women. And St. Lord Aids wants to be that sort of a church. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to worship.